Hello, beautiful people. So today we are with João Souza. João is an award-winning travel and the documentary photograph. He's now living in Beirut, Lebanon. João mission, if we can say, is capture and document unique moments throughout photography while traveling to remote and uncommon places and learn, learning always about the people and their cultures. João, how are you today, my friend? Hello. Uh, well, as you can see, uh, I'm kind of having a Star Wars moment. So I, I, um, I'm now, I've now joined the dark side. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, I'm kind of dark at the moment. I do apologize for that uh, to your viewers. Uh, but the reason is uh, there is actually no electricity uh, at the moment. So uh, just to give a bit of context, I'm living in Beirut at the moment. We are uh, experiencing regular and extended power cuts uh, more than usual. I mean, Lebanon always has power cuts um on a daily basis but uh, due to the crisis and uh, a growing lack of uh, resources um, electricity is very scarce so we're having an average of uh, 20 hours of shutdown per day and then two hours of uh, electricity supply mm, in normal circumstances when the electricity goes off uh, the generator kicks in to compensate the lack of electricity supply However, there are also growing uh, issues uh, getting the, uh, uh, the generator, the fuel for the generator. So there are basically two sources of light in Lebanon, electricity and the generator. So the electricity is off, then you get the generator. But now uh, we're having serious issues in getting the generator as well to supply us with um, the, uh, the remaining source of electricity and overall energy in, in a household. Yeah, we, we talk here in Europe about Corona, but there it's mm. a different reality. So let's start from the beginning as always. How you end up in Beirut, how you start traveling. Can you tell me a little bit about your story? Yeah, well, if we start from the beginning, then we have to go all the way back to 1977 when my parents decided to do uh, doctors and nurses. No, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> uh, we won't go as far as that. Um, I'll spare you the details. Um, right. Well, I had been in Lebanon back in 2016, so nearly four years ago. Uh, I had two months holiday and Lebanon was really not in my plans, but then I met a Lebanese guy through couch surfing. So I stayed with him in Morocco. And so he was kind of, um, you know, a, a very good source of not just information, but also inspiration. He was an amazing guy. Um, Haitam was his name. And he told me, uh, why don't you go to Lebanon? It's totally different, different vibes. You know, you, you've never experienced anything like that. If you have the time and the chance, just just go, you know. And months later, I, I did have a, a two-month uh, window of opportunity to actually travel somewhere. And I thought, okay, I, I want to go somewhere warm because that was October, so Europe was becoming a little bit cold. Um, and uh, the days were shorter, and I wanted to go to a place I had never been before, but then also a place I had heard terrible things about. And I, I'm always keen not on experiencing bad things as such, but uh, actually kind of um, learning a little bit more about those places and, and through the learning process to kind of uh, break some of those taboos or some of those misconceptions about those places. So I thought, okay, I'll head to Beirut. Uh, I, I'll just tell a handful of people, you know, people I, I trust and, and I care about. Uh, but the rest of the people, I, I don't really care about telling them uh, in case they get too worried or whatever. Um, and I'll just go. And, and I did. And I ended up staying for two months. Uh, it was a really amazing story about how I got here not knowing anybody and then just leaving two months later, almost crying at the airport because I was so um, bereft for, for leaving because I really wanted to stay here. Uh, forever you know Lebanon has that kind of a magnetic energy as far as I'm concerned I mean I, I I can accept the fact that some people don't feel the same way towards Lebanon 
uh, I think it's more about my personal connection with Lebanon. I, I feel there's a there's a kind of a an unseen magnetism, uh, and how the country, no matter how messed up it is, it, it still kind of pulls you in. You know, so a bit, a little bit like the mafia. You know, once you you know, <laughs> just when you think in? you're out, yeah, just, just when you think you're going out, they pull you back in. So Lebanon is a bit like the mafia in that sense, in a good way. Okay, so you come back now. Uh, I, yeah, tell me, tell me. Please. Yeah, I yeah, and then I, I again I had uh, maybe two three weeks of um, a spare time to to come to Lebanon, and at the time we're talking about January two thousand and twenty, so this year. And I was living in Georgia, actually. And I was, uh, among other things, I was uh, very invested in doing some uh, photography and documentary photography work on the refugees um, living in uh, old Soviet, abandoned Soviet sanatoriums uh, in a particular town in Georgia. Um, and then I thought, okay, well, I have some spare time and I wouldn't mind you know, going somewhere I have never been before. So Iran was actually my destination. So I bought the ticket and one day before the flight, uh, I was about to withdraw money from a cash machine and the cash machine ate my card. So it retained my card. And because of that, I missed my flight. And, and then I kind of uh, rethought my decision of going to, to Iran because I, I had heard, um, a few people, including Iranian people, telling me maybe this is not the best time because the weather is not very nice. Uh, maybe in the south you'll have a chance to explore some things, but overall the weather is not that good. Uh, also, we're having some uh, civil unrest, you know, demonstrations, the government trying to stifle the people. Um, I think there was kind of a revolutionary movement happening there as well. And then that's when I just decided, okay, instead of Iran, I'll just go very quickly to, to Lebanon because I miss my Lebanese friends. You know, I miss Lebanon. There are a bunch of places I haven't visited yet. And so I booked a flight and I stayed at my friend's, uh, my friend's house, uh, Philippe. Philippe had hosted me uh, back in 2016. Uh, just a remarkable man. Very, very kind. And so, uh, so he, he was thrilled to bits to, to see me and to host me again. But at the same time, a little bit worried because uh, Lebanon, since uh, October the 17th, 2019, so last year, it was going through a, a revolutionary movement and a lot of, um, and what, whatever comes with it, including civil unrest and protests, some of them extremely violent protests. Um, so he, he just warned me, okay, just bear in mind, you know, um, the revolutionary movement is still ongoing. Uh, it went a little bit quiet uh, during Christmas because everybody was just too busy celebrating Christmas. But once Christmas was over, people just, uh, uh took to the streets once again. So, and so he, he, he was kind of, uh, he picked me up at the airport with his girlfriend, Natasha, and, uh. And he said to me, look, uh, whatever you do, just try to avoid these protests. But what happened was, um, you know, the, the, the following day, I contacted a local newspaper called L'Orient Le Jour, which is the only uh, French written uh, publication in the Middle East, uh, historical uh, newspaper, very good reputation, especially uh, among the, the people who uh, speak French not just in Lebanon, but outside Lebanon as well. Wow. And, and I got in touch with them because I, I, I had some of my work published with them uh, last year. And I thought it would be really interesting to meet them in person, you know, kind of visit the place where they published the newspaper. Um, and, uh, and something extraordinary happened. Uh, so I met with the editorial team and they told me, look, uh, we're currently looking for a photographer, you know, somebody who can work with us on a regular basis. Would you be interested? I said, well, I'm here for three weeks, so why not? Um, so I had to tell Philippe, look, man, uh, I know you care about my safety, but um, I'm now having to, you know, to cover the protest. <laughs> so I think it was that weekend, you know, like two, three days after I arrived, 
uh, I went on the streets and started shooting and and then you know the rest is history so I've ever since January I've been here in Beirut and I've been here as a photojournalist uh, mainly for the Lochian Leisure and lots of publications uh, already um, you know under my belt so I'm I'm very happy you know despite you know all the hardships that I'm I'm witnessing here on a daily basis yeah, long well, story short <laughs> yeah no 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 perfect and uh, and I want to know a little bit more uh, how it is the the current situation why why they are pro protesting for the people that are, are a little bit lost with the situation in Lebanon if you can sure. what is the reason mm. Well, it's kind of an accumulation of, of several serious issues this country has been experiencing over the past decades. So they had a civil war, they had an Israeli invasion, a Syrian invasion as well. Um, uh, but, but, you know, just when you thought that, okay, well, the country should recover from that, uh, the problem is the extreme political corruption that uh, took place and just installed itself here in, in Lebanon uh, where you know you have the political powers just taking everything they can so they uh, avoid uh, building or rebuilding or nurturing uh, new and uh, efficient infrastructures for the Lebanese people we're talking about roads access to electricity access to, to drinkable water um, access to fair prices because most of the things uh, that Lebanese people consume are actually imported. Um, you know, garbage collection. I mean, th th there are so many things that are fundamentally dysfunctional and, and wrong about this country. Uh, and that is to do with, mainly to do with uh, the political corruption. You know, they, they grab all the money they can and then very, left, very little is left to actually make this country into a livable, uh, place for you know for, for the standards that I think people should have um, so uh, in in October you know enough was enough people just um, actually it was it was interesting because um, the, the government suggested that they should apply um, a five dollar uh, per month tax on the Lebanese people for using whatsapp which is a free app you know, they, they were even going that way, you know, they were even thinking, well, let's just take as much as we can, including something that we shouldn't, you know. Uh, so some people originally called it the WhatsApp revolution. Um, but there were other issues as well. Um, you know, the banks, for example, you know, they, they were willing to take uh, as much money from the expats, you know, just to give you a, an idea, you have between four and five million Lebanese people living in Lebanese soil. Mm -hmm. And then you have around 10 to 15 million outside Lebanon. You know, they, they're kind of the result of what they call the Lebanese diaspora uh, due to the famine and, you know, the early uh, 20th century, but also mm -hmm. the, the civil war. I think the civil war was kind of the, the biggest catalyst to push uh, people away from this country and so most Lebanese people actually live abroad they don't live here uh, but they are responsible for injecting uh, a, a generous amount of money that ends up here um, now that money comes in in dollars or used to um, and which would then get exchanged in the black market so you know you could actually make a, a very uh, a, a substantial profit by coming here with dollars and then exchange it uh, by liras and then just you know live like a king. Um, but you know that that has changed in the meantime because um, if you hold a Lebanese bank card, if you have a Lebanese bank account, mm -hmm. you have a limit of how many dollars you can actually withdraw uh, from Lebanese banks. Uh, that depends on the bank, you know, you could have, I don't know, $100 per week or $200 every two weeks um, or $400 per month, whatever. Um, and also, uh, you can't really now use those cards abroad. This is why a lot of Lebanese people are feeling uh, completely unable to, to go abroad and just for the simple act of going somewhere 
using their card, extracting the dollars and then coming back. You know, they, they can't do that anymore. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it, it's interesting on one hand. On the other hand, it's uh, very shocking for me to uh, observe how the majority of Lebanese people are not going on the streets. They're not protesting. They're not actually actively doing anything. Uh, this is not a criticism. I, I, at a personal level, I, I, I feel a bit strongly about that. You know, I, I, in my mind, I could conceive that, uh, you know, this would be enough to have all 5 million people to just hit the streets and not leave the streets until these things are fixed. But um, I, I have to be a little bit more objective and desensitized. And... But from from a, a foreigner's perspective, an outsider's perspective, such as myself, it is it's very surprising to say the least to not see a, a mass movement of people hitting the streets and protesting. So the people protesting are always the same, um, and we're talking about sometimes twenty, sometimes a hundred, sometimes two hundred, um, which, in the grand scheme of things, it's a very modest number, you know. Yeah. It's it's incredible, yeah. But it's like you you were talking. If you are worried to get water or food, it's a little bit difficult. It's mm. you are you are like in, in the, you are like a rat spinning around. Like there's not a lot. It's it's really difficult. Yeah, it becomes it becomes a vicious circle. I mean, the, the poorest people I've met, uh, they 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 were kind of kept poor because they were just too busy, you know, surviving. Um, exactly. But we're, even though you do have people like that here in Lebanon, I would say most people are still not at that stage. So a lot of people could, you know, have, have a meal in the morning and just hit the streets and protest. But um, I suspect this is going to be, to be inevitable at some point because more people are losing their jobs. Uh, Lebanon is uh, rated as the, the third country in the world with the highest inflation rate. So uh, I think it's just a matter of time until you have more people hitting the streets and, and protesting, you know, we'll see. Hope so far somewhere, I hope so. Like mm. It has to change, but, and to understand a little bit, because I'm seeing that you are not just, you don't want just to take a beautiful picture, but mm. have, you, have a meaning behind. Mm. Uh, first why you start why you start uh, traveling mm -hmm. what it comes first traveling or the photography and why it has to have a meaning okay that's a very interesting question um so uh, i always had a, a an interest in photography and kind of visual uh, narratives uh, whether it would that was through video or photography or even drawing and painting, which I used to do, uh, especially when I was a kid. Um, but about 10 years ago, you know, I got, got a camera, a digital camera, and I, I remember I wanted to, to go through this exercise. So it started as a hobby. I wanted to do this exercise of being able to uh, narrate something, you know, create some kind of a visual message through one frame. Uh, which is incredibly difficult for me to, to, to do, you know, and most times I fail, you know, I take hundreds of pictures and maybe one or two uh, can be, can be used for that purpose. Um, and I was living in England at the moment. So I immigrated to England back in 2006, so 14 years ago. And I based myself in the South of England, you know, I had a stable job at the university. So I was working with disabled students. And uh, in Bournemouth University, and um, you know, I was really happy there. You know, I would somehow manage to find uh, some time, a few times a year, to travel. At the time, I had a Hungarian girlfriend, so we would spend a substantial amount of time, holiday time, in Hungary uh, or Portugal. Uh, but um, you know. The camera was always with me. I would snap some pictures, but uh, but it was kind of on and off. I, I didn't have a, a discipline as such. I didn't have, which I think is really important. And I think writers would, will tell you that even if they don't feel inspired, they should always have a, a notepad and a pen and just write, you know, force themselves to sit down and write every day. Um, 
I didn't have the, the discipline of taking the camera with me at all times and just shoot, you know, force myself to, to take pictures. Now I do. Um, for a few years I've been doing that, but uh, not at the time. And traveling, I, I think uh, the, the word is as vague as it gets because you get uh, people telling me, oh, I'm a traveler or I travel, I'm a full-time nomad, whatever. Um, for me, everybody travels, you know, you, you travel when you wake up, when you go to work, when you go to the supermarket, everything can be a journey if you, if you think about that. Uh, or even in your dreams, you know, when you go to sleep and you travel through your subconscious, you know, it takes you to places, you know. Um, but I, I always had the interest of uh, somehow, you know, just disappearing and, and going somewhere. And, and that feeling became extremely compelling when I was, when I, when I went through a breakup and so I was engaged, I was about to get married and then things didn't work out. We broke up and I told this story a million times. Um, and I remember talking to my best friend, uh, Andre, he's a filmmaker actually in, in England. And, and I called him and I said, look, I, I, I just want to disappear. I want to get a, get a tent and then just go to the desert. You know, that, that was the, the, a very uh, visceral feeling I had at the time. And he said, look, cool down, cool your head down. Can you hear this? Yes, of course. It's an alarm. I have no idea where this is coming from, so apologies. Nothing works in Beirut, but at least we have an, a, a very annoying alarm going on. Okay, okay. They heard me. Um, so, and he said, look, don't, don't just do anything rash. Don't, don't just uh, disappear, you know. Save some money, treat yourself to, you know, good nutrition, exercise, go out with your friends and, and just enjoy life a little bit and then kind of reassess. And that's what I did. And that, that year was very important for me. I went through counseling for the first time in my life. So I opened up to a psychologist about some of, uh, some of my personal issues. That was groundbreaking as far as my perception of life was. Um, and, um, and also, I did exercise a lot. I ate very well. I saved some money. So at the end of the, that year, I had about 3,000 euros saved up. Um, and uh, at the same time, I was networking with, uh, uh, with people online who had gone through the, the experience that I wanted to have, which was to, uh, to travel you know, uh, extensively. So not just for a couple of weeks, but actually attempt to, to travel for a uh, maybe a year, six months, a year, see where that would take me. And um, they gave me a lot of uh, valuable advice and suggestions and tips and things that I, I could do. All the possibilities, including low budget possibilities, which were, that's what I was looking for because you know 3,000 euros can only take you so far. Um, so, you know, they introduced me to the concept of uh, work away, you know, volunteering in exchange for food and, and, uh, and a roof over your head, um, you know, reviving couch surfing. I had tried couch surfing before, but they told me he, that is going to be a very important uh, element in your low budget travels. Um, you know, uh, camping, uh, hitchhiking and all of these different things that I hadn't tried before, at least on my own. And so I told my boss, look, I, I need to go. <laughs> and uh, she actually signed me for a, a one year sabbatical leave, annual leave, not annual leave, sorry, career break. That's what they call it. Right. Um, and that was it. So August, end of August, 2015, I just hit the road on my own. And, and it was me, the tent, the backpack, you know, the uh, sleeping bag, and then the camera. So for me, it was important, not so much for the, the purpose of uh, doing photojournalism as such. Uh, it was more about taking interesting pictures of the places, but most importantly, the people uh, who would be part of my journey. Because I, I was, that was kind of the only plan, specific plan, uh, which was to, to be able to um, connect with people and uh, make people the core of my travel. So the location wasn't that important. I actually, I missed 
a lot of uh, touristic places and places that people always take for granted when you go to certain countries. Um, not on purpose, but because uh, I would just end up getting stuck in uh, less known places because of the people. You know, I found them interesting. I found them, you know, uh, heartwarming and uh, also very different from me and the reality I was coming from. And for me, that was more important than the place or the name of the town or the, or the you know, whatever background information you have on that town or the or that landmark uh, that was the core you know the, the people and the connection perfect and how, how you end up of course the people i understand that is the the the, the main uh, goal of your photography but how you end up like taking pictures of refugees uh, mm -hmm. like why 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 not uh, some beautiful girl in georgia you understand me yeah i, I do take pictures occasionally of, uh, of beauty uh i i like beauty of course oh, yeah. um but yeah that's a good question i i don't know i i can't really give you a straight answer uh sometimes people do look i mean they're, they're looking for a photo shoot and they hear about me and then they think about hiring me, but then they go on my page or my Instagram feed and they think, eh, okay, well, there's, there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, decadence in here. It's not that I'm drawn to it, but um, it's more about how I, I, I feel that it's important to, uh, first of all, to understand that reality, which is, you know, I'm a, uh, you know, a white dude from Europe, you know, I, I can be considered myself uh, privileged um, in, a, in a lot of ways um, when I compare myself with, with so many, with millions and millions of other people uh, around the world who don't have 1% of the chances that I've had in my life, you know. So I could have just stayed in that little bubble and okay well you know this is this is my life i can just uh, have a comfortable existence and you know just pay attention to that reality but i've always been curious about things that are fundamentally different from my my own uh and that's how i ended up in you know for example in slovenia uh, not so much in the idyllic parts of slovenia although i i was there i, w I was there for a short while but I ended up living with uh, some uh, punk anarchist squatters in an abandoned house in Novo Meso. For me, you know, when you put it that way, you know, the expression in, in those terms, I, I'm in. I think, okay, I've, I've never done anything <laughs> like this. But, it, but this is not, uh, I don't want people to start thinking, well, you know, this is uh, uh, poverty porn or, oh, well, he's just drawn to the excitement of ticking just another box. Okay, I did this, I did that. No, 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 it's not like that. I, I go with the flow. I, I tend to have very little control over the narrative of my own life. I I, I could do that, I guess. I, I could just plan things and decide, okay, in three years time, I'll, I'll be here. 10 years time, I'll be there. I could do that. Maybe I'm too lazy for that, or maybe I'm just not that emotionally invested in doing that. I, I much prefer to be surprised by the, the possibilities of life, you know? And, and the thing is, it's like falling in love, whatever. You know, when you choose something, you put aside all the other options. So you could regret that. Oh my God, I could have done this or I could have done that. But, or you can just be really happy with that one choice that you made. And the choice that I make is go with the flow. And, and that's how I ended up in that house living with those people who were so different. They, they still are. They're very, very, very different from me. And yet, um, I found points of connection, points where we could actually meet at, uh, um, I don't want to call them spiritual level. You know, I, I don't think there's anything spiritual or religious about it, but, um, but emotionally, I would say. You know, a lot of these people were outcasts themselves. I always consider myself kind of an outsider. Uh, not just with my family, but uh, my country, um, my culture. So I, whatever you want to call it, my culture. You know, there, there are lots of subcultures within the 
the place where you come from. But I always felt like, I always felt like an outsider. And I think that was the point of connection with those people. Uh, they also felt very detached from the social reality they were living in. Some of them had experienced uh, trauma and, uh, and they were kind of together and they had each other's backs. Mm. And the, 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 I, I would say the common denominator was them against the system, you know, the society, whatever. That was kind of their, their mission. Um, and they expressed themselves through art, you know, painting, sculpting, uh, music. So they were very gifted individuals. Um, and that's it. So and I, I ended up staying there for two months in that house, you know. And then I went back twice in, in the two consecutive years, so 2017, 2018, I was also there, you know, I had, a, I felt like there was unfinished business uh, in, in that place. Uh, so, yeah, I, you're right, I could, I could just exclusively focus on the obviously beautiful things in front of me. Mm, but I'm drawn to other things. I, I, I I try not to feel too guilty about it. Um, uh, you know, it, it's just what it is, you know, but if people want idyllic locations, stunning landscape photos or beautiful models, you know, they, they have options elsewhere. I, I focus on other things. I respect that a lot, my friend, really. It's something that I respect. <laughs> Can we say that you are in the, if, if, if you can say that, that you already find, found your purpose in life as a mm. photographer, a documental mm -hmm. photographer? Uh, I don't know about that. You know, I, I, I'm learning about myself and the more I observe and the more I hear people talking about who I am and what I do, um, I, <laughs> it's kind of a scary feeling that I, sometimes I don't really, really know who I am. Uh, just to give you an idea, you know, I studied linguistics uh, in a Portuguese university, uh, so I did my major in linguistics, uh, but then I lost interest, so I moved to yoga, so I became a yoga instructor. Uh, I taught yoga for many years, and then I moved to England. I also kept on teaching yoga, but my, my heart was more into other things, so I then, I started working with uh, disabled students in the university. Uh, I had a multitude of hobbies, uh, you know, uh, photography, painting, mm, writing as well, playing music. Uh, I, I learned to play a few instruments. Uh, now I can't remember, unfortunately, most of what I learned, but, um, but yeah, so I kind of tend to go with the flow and if I like something, I, I stick to it, but only as long as I like it. Um, I, I'll make some sacrifices to kind of you know, uh, hone in the the, uh, uh, the ability to master those things. But uh, if it doesn't come from a place of passion and uh, genuine interest, then I, I, I can't be bothered. And, and I think that the older I get, you know, uh, the less patience I have for things that don't really motivate me. But what you said about the purpose of life, I, I, I do have a, a very strong memory of, which happened five years ago, um, when I was um, kind of in this crossroad, this was the year before I started traveling. And I, I had this kind of a pre-midlife crisis, I think. I was 38 at the time. And, and I remember just waking up sweating, you know, and, and extremely agitated about not knowing my purpose in life, not knowing what my passion was, you know. And, and that freaked me out completely. I thought, what am I now? I mean, I, I've never been married, never had kids. Um, I have a nine to five job. I mean, nothing really meaningful as such. I have meaningful friendships, um, but that's about it. But I never really knew, uh, I, I never really felt the calling of, of something specific that just, makes you get out of bed and, and do it and uh, where you know you forget to to eat you forget to go to the toilet you forget to sleep because you're so um immersed in that activity whatever that activity is um 
and at the time, I was reading a lot of self-help books and you know literature overall that that could give me a sense of uh, perspective about life and about who I was. But it was actually something, and I, I, you know, for the life of me, I really can't remember where it came from, how I came across it. But I did come across this uh, very short video segment. Uh, it was Oprah talking to. Uh, Elizabeth Gilbert, the writer of uh, Eat, Pray, Love, a book I've never read, a, a movie I've never watched, but uh, what she was saying was simply this, you know, forget about passion. You know, passion is a, a one-night stand, it's, it's this fire thing, but it also burns quickly, you know. Um, so instead of, and, and what she was saying was, you know, it can be very painful if you don't know what your passion is. You know, people say, just follow your passion, follow your passion. Well, if you know what your passion is, that's easy. You just follow it. You're probably already following it anyway, so you don't even need that piece of advice. But if you don't know, uh, then it can be very overwhelming and very uh, defeating. You know, you, you just go home and go, well, I, I haven't found it. I don't know what it is. I, what am I supposed to follow here? And she put it in very plain terms. And I think that's the, the great thing about any writer, any author, is when they can grasp something so deep and so compelling and then just translate that into a very simple message. What she suggested was follow your curiosity. Okay. So, you know, passion, like she said, you know, it's a one night stand, it's a fire thing, you know, you. You can be passionate about something, but you, you know, you don't necessarily feel passionate about that every single day. But every single day, you could be curious about something. And so, you know, following that curiosity may lead you to finding your passion. And then from there, you could start following your passion. Or worst case scenario, you could spend your whole lifetime just following your gorgeous curiosity, as she, she said. And that should be okay too, you know? And that was such a relief for me to, to listen to those words. And I kind of, you know, repeated the video a few times so I could really digest the, the concept. And, and that's when I thought, okay, I'm not gonna worry about this. I don't owe anything to anybody. I don't owe money to anybody. I don't owe expectations or results apart from the people I work for or, you know, but this, uh, this idea of having to seek people's validation, which was very strong in me for many years, I always felt subconsciously that I, I, I had to prove myself to people. But actually the reality is um, you don't owe anything to anybody by default. You, know, you, could, you could owe money if, if you ask for money uh, or if... Um, or when you work for somebody, then you have a contract and, you know, they are expected you to deliver that work. But apart from those two things, there's absolutely nothing you owe to anybody. And once you, once I realized that, I, it, it you know, life became much simpler and I, I kind of put all the guilt aside of doing what I was doing, despite the fact that some people didn't understand it or didn't agree with it. Uh, I mean, to be honest, a few people were very shocked with my decision of leaving my stable job and heading out to, you know, to explore the world on my own without any financial security or any income at the time. So uh, for me, it was, it was interesting to, to notice that, that some people were still kind of expecting me to uh, you know get their validation mm. uh, it was disappointing you know some people who i thought were my my dear friends turned their backs on me you know because they didn't understand this new me mm -hmm. uh but you know i think that's also a good filter i guess you know when you when you're unashamed of being yourself and to do the things that you truly from the heart you know you really want to do and some people embrace that, but other people reject it. Okay, well, that's, that's good, you know, um, no, no hard feelings, you know, and you just move on. And, and that was it. I am talking a lot, I'm, I'm aware of this. I have no idea.
No, how I, long I'm talking for. I don't. I, for me, time it's not a problem because it's it's a lot of like like in in the interviews it's a lot of knowledge like a lot of advice. I think like two main two main things that if if I can tell from this, it's man, it's perfect. Follow your curiosity, and yeah. you don't own nothing to no fucking nobody, man. Yeah, there was an author I was reading at the time. Now he's quite oh, yes. famous. At the time, he was kind of not that mainstream. Uh, a friend of mine sent me uh, an article by him, which was called The Art of Not Giving a Fuck by Mark Manson. I know. Okay. Uh, yeah, you, obviously you're familiar with the title. But at the time, it was actually an article he wrote. It was not a book. Yeah. And, and the kind of the punchline of that article was you don't owe anything to anybody. I think it was in that article. I'm not sure now. I read it five years ago. But there was a collection of articles written by him and, and kind of the, the motto was this, you know, you just um, be honest with yourself. And that can be a, a really good filter. You don't waste anybody's time and people can just read you very quickly and they understand your nature. Hmm. And, and you, you can actually maximize uh, and capitalize if you want. The, the time, the precious time that you have on this planet, you know. Uh, but yeah, Elizabeth Kilburn, uh, with that video segment that I watched about follow your curiosity and then Mark Manson, you know, you don't owe anything to anybody. I, I think those, those are two very important messages that I've been trying to, to live by, you know. Great advice for me also. And no, <laughs> really, I'm curious now, Imagine that I'm in the situation that, like Juan was in England a couple of years ago, but I'm too afraid to go put my backpack and go away. Or, or mm. imagine it doesn't have to be so extreme if I'm, I'm too afraid to find a new job. Easy. Mm. Which advice yeah. you will give me? Mm. That's a tricky one because, um, I mean, first of all, who am I? to give anybody advice. Um, we're all grown-ups, we're all adults, so we should, we should not just embrace our adulthood, but also uh, be accountable for that, you know? Because whether we like it or not, we, we do have uh, responsibilities towards ourselves, um, maybe our families as well, but mostly ourselves to, to be who we, we want to be in what we're capable of being, you know, this is what we are, this is what we want to be, this is kind of, and then the, in this line you have, uh, you know, uh, possibility, you know, um, or the conditions to give you access to what you want. And sometimes, uh, you know, those conditions are limited, you know. Uh, I know a number of people who, who say, well, we would love to travel, but now we're stuck because we have kids or because, you know, we have jobs, we have a mortgage, et cetera, et cetera. So I, 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 I'm not, I don't feel qualified to tell these people, well, you know, just live, leave your job and go and explore the world. You know, I've seen a lot of memes, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of Instagram accounts just kind of uh, pushing that agenda into people. Mm. It can be inspirational, but just like with follow your passion message, it can also be very, um, very frustrating because then, you know, how do you do it? Now, I've met a few, a few couples who are able to work remotely. So they, they're kind of digital nomads, if you want to call them like that. So they teach English online or they create marketing content uh, whilst on the road. And so they are able to sustain their lives and provide the minimum comfort and safety to, to themselves and their children. Um, I've also met people who, you know, they have uh, seasonal work, you know, they, they work a few months a year. And then instead of just taking one or two weeks off, they take six months off and they just go to a remote place they've never been to. They take their kids with them or the kids stay with the grandparents. I don't know. Um, I would say that more than to tell people, well, just do it. Uh, that's that's Shia LaBeouf's job, you know. He he tells people just do it. I don't know if you're familiar with that video. Uh, no, 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 no. Shia, no, LaBeouf, no. Shia LaBeouf is this um, American actor, 
and uh, so there's this um, video <laughs> it's been around for a while now I will uh, like a motivational video where he's he's got this green screen I, I i think he put the green screen on purpose so people can just use it to put all sorts of crazy things uh, in the background but he's he's just saying just do it he starts shouting you know uh don't leave it for tomorrow you know uh, make your dreams come true it, it's it's i mean i i it's funny but i i believe he probably motivated a lot of people to just do what they want uh, but i would say this um whatever choice you make in life uh if you don't have any other choice then you should really uh make sure that you are at least happy with that choice uh, because there's nothing worse than making a decision and we're all adults here, you know, and we, we still have um, some, some of us have a limited amount of power of choice, but I would say most of us do have the, at least the ability to make a conscious decision about what they want to do. So if you make that one choice, uh, then you have to be prepared to deal with the consequences of, the, of that choice and not bitch about that because then, because now you wish that you hadn't been married or you hadn't uh, got yourself into a mortgage or a, a nine to five job, you know, or make it temporary, you know, see, set yourself a little light at the end of the tunnel where you think, okay, well, now this is my reality and I'm going to race it. Uh, I talked to a lot of fathers for example they were not let become fathers but you know they just wanted to do what uh, you know and i think the the difference uh by the way vash can you hear me now yes yes perfect it does a okay, little okay. bit stop but i'm listening perfect the all, right, all right i'm just checking just checking the internet um the internet is another thing that goes off every now and then <laughs> welcome to welcome to lebanon um yeah, so the fathers, uh, not ready for that, but then I, I think their lives improved massively. The quality of lives and the, the relationships, the moment they just accept the, the fact that, okay, now I'm a father. I have a little creature here, and I need to nurture this creature. You know, I need to support my, my woman and be here. And, and you could see their level of happiness just going off the roof because they they accepted that, you know, they, they, they accepted that, okay, this was my choice. And, and now this is reality. You know, I could still daydream about backpacking and traveling the world, but uh, this is my reality now. So I think whatever decision you make, you should be happy with it, or at least not make everybody around you feel miserable and awful because you're not living the reality that you wanted, you know? So uh, again, Sorry for the long-winded no, no, no. answer, but I think if you have the conditions and if you want to do something, hmm. then maybe you can push yourself in a healthy way, of course. Hmm. Push yourself to to go for it. You know, set a deadline for yourself. Okay, I have no money. Okay, save some money. Well, but you know, supermarkets are really expensive. Okay, go to cheap supermarkets or cheaper supermarkets. Uh, when I was in England. I used to shop. I used to shop in the same supermarket, and I was not able to save money. And I, I was wondering what what is what what is going on? You know, I'm I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't go clubbing that regularly. I don't eat out. Why am I not able to save money? And then I was checking. I was scrutinizing the the supermarket bills, and then I was checking out the supermarkets, and I realized I was actually spending an average of fifty pounds a, a week for my food. Uh, and daily, you know, daily necessities and, and all that. And, and then I noticed that other supermarkets were selling the same items for, you know, half the price. So I started doing a combination of different supermarkets uh, to do my weekly shopping. And I went down from 50 uh, pounds a week to 12 pounds a week on supermarket bills. Uh, and thus being able to save some money, you know, which, you know, it's cumulative. So at, at the end of the year, I, I had quite a lot of money. I had saved up quite a lot of money because of just that simple decision. So set yourself some goals, uh, realistic goals, deadlines, you know, 
uh, where, so you want to travel the world, you want to backpack, but you're too afraid because you don't know, you might never be able to work, you might never be able to be in a comfortable situation. Well, that is a risk. So you have to weigh that risk and, and, and think, is it worth it? Um, and then, you know, start cutting costs on things that aren't vital for you, you know? And then, and then yes, and then just do it. Um, but I, I would say, you know, I, I still remember, and there was a click in my mind when, uh, because I, my last job at the university was to timetable, you know, to manage the human resources in the School of uh, Finance. What was it? Business School, that was the name. And then it changed to Faculty of Management. And uh, I remember, um, so, my work was basically time management, space management, but also time. And so I, I remember in January, I was looking at the calendar for the following year. And what I saw in front of me was the same piece of paper that I get uh, every year. So this is the calendar for the following academic year. And this is all that you need to do. And you need to somehow timetable you know, a few hundreds of lecturers and academics to, you know, to those weeks, to those academic weeks. And I remember looking at this piece of paper and I thought this piece of paper is the same as the year before and the year before and the year before. And what if I'm in, in a place, you know, camping or just by the fire with total strangers, you know, yes. in that week and the, the so I, I started looking at possibilities there and I thought, okay, so next year I can make it into the same kind of year I've always had for the past 10 years, or I could have a completely different year. And, and so that also, you know, again, the, the curiosity element, exactly. I thought, I thought, how about that? Cause that, that is now making me curious that that's making me wonder about the, mm -hmm. uh, the possibilities you know mm -hmm. and and so yeah that, that was also a, a good nurturing element to or motivating element to to go you know and yeah so i think yeah i don't i don't think there's a, a one size fits all model in terms of motivating people to escape their daily rut and hit the road whatever they, they want to do i think for you know each individual should be respected and we shouldn't push our agendas to oh, just just quit your job, you know, and live the dream. Well, really? I mean, I, I don't know about that. You know, it's it easier to say. Work. Yeah, it can work for some people. It can be an absolutely disastrous piece of advice for, for other people. I think you can use your personal example. And if um, if you really want to be generous and, and, and help, just give them your specific example of how you were able to survive and uh, or how you were able to do it to make yeah. it happen. But also all the sacrifices that come with it. Because yes, in a five job and the mortgage payment, family raising, you have tremendous sacrifices. And, hmm. and we may even think, well, but at least you, you have a stable life. Well, not really. You could, you could lose your job. Uh, your landlord may kick you out. Uh, you might become disabled and now you can't take care of your own kids. You know, nothing is certain in life. We, we can't just, you know, believe that just because we have a nine to five and all that stability, that's all that life is going to be like. Not at all. Um, so I, I think... Uh, you know, but at, at least for those people, it, it's also important to, to, to show them, okay, you want to live the dream, you want to go on the road, but you have to be aware that most, most days you don't really know where you're going to sleep. Most mm -hmm. days you don't know what you're going to eat. Most days you don't know who you're going to find on the road. It may be a really spectacular person. I would have to say, in the majority of cases, most people you, you will meet are very kind, you know, and very interested in knowing travelers especially people very far from home but you will also probably encounter some bad people on the way or some adversities and now you're so far from from your, your references that that really hits you you know how alone you are how vulnerable you are 
Are you ready for that? Because I don't know. Uh, I think people sometimes confuse uh, traveling with holidays, you know. And I had some friends with some cheeky. I, I know where it came came from. It's the the jealousy, you know, the the perception that I'm on a permanent vacation while they have to get up and go to work, which is nothing like that. Um, so they say, well, you know, you're on a holiday. No, my friend, this is not a holiday. Holiday is when you have a specific uh, time frame and you've paid for a nice hotel room with a swimming pool, with a, you know, a sea view. And you go to a restaurant, you treat yourself to some really nice meals and partying, and then you go back to, uh, to your routine. That's a holiday. Uh, being a so-called traveler or a nomad or whatever, that's not a holiday. Um, I can count with the fingers of one hand how many hotels I've stayed in in the, in the last five years um, or how many luxury meals I've had uh, or how many sea views I had. You know, uh, these are sacrifices you, you need to take into account. And I think more important than to just relying on a meme saying, quit your job and live the dream or start traveling, whatever, mm -hmm. travel the world. I think more important is to network with as many uh, travelers, uh, nomads, uh, people who work remotely, um, families, you know, if you happen to have one and, and you're worried about that, okay, I want to reconcile long-term traveling with raising a family. Okay, you need to get in touch with those people and get into their heads, get as much information as you can uh, from those people, you know? Um, don't, don't rely on memes. Memes are good to kind of uh, wake you up in, in, a, in, a, in a way, but they, are, they, they cannot be a, a recipe for success uh, in, in, in functional uh, terms, efficient terms. You need to really understand who you are, your reality, and then customize it, customize your, your travel experience. Yeah, I think that's, I think that once is, again, no, 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 no. Long, long winded. <laughs> Man, yeah. why, why we have to short it? You know, if life, life has to be like that because it's, and I think it's advice, not just for the travelers, but for everyone that is afraid to try and try to talk with the people yeah. that you you'd like. If you want to be a doctor or if you want to be a writer, try to talk with the writer, like, or a traveler, yeah. you know, like to understand yeah. if you like, I think it's, it's a great advice. And you, you talk um, about success. How do you define yeah. success? Uh, I, uh, good question as well. Um, hmm. I think success is, is what you want to achieve and then being able to achieve. So it's setting up a goal and then uh, and follow, follow the steps to, to get to that goal and then successfully achieve it. So this is as big as it gets. Um, but if you're asking me about my personal success, um, I would say my goal since five years ago has been to uh, to stay on the road as long as I could, if I can. Um, so from that perspective, I've been 100% success. Uh, so that that is that is the bar for me, you know, okay. What do I want to achieve? I want to stay on the road for five years, or I want to stay on the road for as long as I can. And so far, I've been I've been achieving that. Mm, but then within that, uh, I've, every now and then I kind of set up a few uh, goals. Uh, and I think it was three years ago, I kind of set up a goal to uh, start being uh, published in uh, you know by publications whether those uh, printed newspapers or online publications, whatever, uh, with my photography. And, and that, that took a while, that took a while because I, I was also not just for uh, less mainstream projects, uh, which are less like 
basically to, to get published, but um, I was also not doing the right kind of networking. You know, I think uh, most of the people you see getting published are necessarily the best at what they do. And Instagram is actually an, an interesting platform to showcase that uh, reality, which is, uh, it's not necessarily the most interesting, most compelling people with the most compelling stories uh, who get the highlights. It's the people who constantly, relentlessly, tenaciously create noise to the point that you can you cannot be ignored anymore. And then all of a sudden, these people have hundreds of thousands of followers. And you look at their content, you think, yeah, but that's just the picture of your butt and the beautiful landscape and background and with a caption saying, uh, live today like there's no tomorrow, hashtag YOLO, whatever. Um, which is, it's so empty. I'm being very judgmental here now, but, but this person really worked hard to get their followers, to get their, uh, to get their audience, to get their likes and, uh, you know, their, their clicks and all that. Uh, so, you know, kudos to them, you know, well done. They, they've managed to uh, use a platform which is so competitive uh, able to with not that interesting content as far as I'm concerned you know mm -hmm. I, I like asses women's asses but uh, <laughs> I mean I, I don't need I don't need a, you know to go on Instagram to see that but um, but you, you 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 get that kind of content which is as empty as it gets and yet you get hundreds of thousands of people just going absolutely crazy about that content um, so I think the same thing applies to arts or the press or whatever. Sometimes you see things that you think, well, actually, I, I know somebody who could do better than that. But that person is not that well known and, uh, or doesn't have the right kind of, kind of connections. And, and so I tried to kind of not resent too much that because I did get in touch with a few publishers few newspapers and magazines and you know they were just either not responding uh, which is very typical especially in Portugal I have to say in Portugal there's still this culture of not replying not to you know not, not, not saying anything just leave you in a, in a void of silence um, or people just simply saying yeah well that's a nice picture but I, we're not interested in the subject I'm really sorry uh, so I think, uh, you know, if there's something that we need to do is, uh, and, and I kind of, I, I think I took the easier in that, the easiest route in that, in that sense. Because I, I could have just, so why should I continue doing it? Uh, but actually, or I could just say, well, I, okay, so if they want these subjects, then I will focus on those subjects and I will just work my ass off to get those subjects so that I can finally get published. But instead, I took a kind of a third route, which I think actually was the easiest for me, which was, you know what? To enjoy what I do, then I'll just keep enjoying what I do. And if if uh, somewhere along the line somebody wants it, then okay, let's talk business. Uh, if if they don't want to, at the end of the day, I won't be frustrated by saying, "Yeah, I yeah, I got published, but I, I really didn't like that. It was all I did, I did the subject that I wanted to cover." At the end of the day, I go to bed and go like, "That was a good day. I I met some interesting people, took some really interesting photos." learn something new okay that's my game you know um there was a there, there, there was a, an interview or a kind of the making of a film called birds which was um a, kind of a biopic it was a biopic film uh, directed by clint eastwood on charlie parker the jazz musician who died very young tragically and and one of the actors remembers being in a quiet set with Clint Eastwood as they were filming, 
and Clint Eastwood turned to, to the guy. Clint Eastwood doesn't really talk that much. He's not a, a talker, he's a doer. And he turned to the actor and he said, you know what? And, and he was very, uh, you, you could feel that the guy was very happy with that moment. Clint Eastwood was very happy. When he said this, he said, you know what? Even if nobody watches this film, I'm really happy that we're making this. Now we're talking about an, uh, an Oscar award-winning director. You know, he was nominated as an act as an actor as well. Uh, he was in Hollywood. I mean, he was Mr. Hollywood for decades. I mean, this guy is an icon, and yet he was also very interested in doing less mainstream movies and knew about the, the pressure of the studios of uh, getting material that would sell. But he was not a sellout. He for him, it was key to keep doing what he wanted to do. And so uh, that's, that is also where I stand. You know, in most cases, I, I either don't make enough money or I don't make a lot of money or I don't make money at all or I lose money. And, but I go to bed with a feeling of satisfaction that at least I did something in my own terms and I, I enjoy them. And here's a, a, an interesting thing. Uh, I remember... Two years ago, I created my web page with photography, and they were mainly um, travel, uh, actual photography content. I also had photo essays of specific subjects that I had covered over the years. And one of the subjects was, uh, one of the essays was this, um, about this uh, very notorious neighborhood here in Beirut, which I visited and then shot uh, four years ago, and, and the name of the neighborhood is Khandak El Khami. Now, if you say this name to any Lebanese person, they will go like, oh, watch out. That's not a safe place. Uh, and it's, mm, I wouldn't say it's not a welcoming place for Lebanese people. You know, they're, they're very strongly associated to the two political parties, uh, Hezbollah and Amal. Uh, so there are a lot of guns there, you know, there's not, not, not a lot of, uh, I would say, welcoming elements. Uh, and yet, when I was there, as an outsider, for me, it was quite a privilege because the moment they realized that I was not a threat to them, they opened their doors and they were like, okay, we'll just shoot anything you want, you know? And so I was there just taking pictures of the place, the people, the, you know, the, the atmosphere. And, and then I, I did publish that on my webpage. And last year, I get a very unexpected email uh, from Logan Alojo, from the newspaper here in, in Lebanon. And they said, look, we're working on a piece about Khandak El Khami. Uh, everything is written down, and yet we have no photos. We don't want to risk anything and send uh, one of our staff to take pictures of the neighborhoods because we are aware of the limitations and the, the risks the safety risks of sending somebody there. Uh, so we Googled Khandak El Khami just to see if there was any photography material out there. And, and they found me, you know, the, among the few uh, available resources on the subject, they found my photography. And that was kind of an unspoken goal for me, which was, okay, I either can do the you know, let's just advertise, 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 you know, get my name out there, get billions of followers, job done and, and kind of invest my time and energy on the marketing more mm -hmm. than the content. Exactly. Uh, or I could just do my stuff, stay off the radar as much as possible. So it's kind of a, I, I know it's um, counterintuitive in a way uh, because I, I do want people to, to know my work. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, I don't want to push it into people and, and I, I don't have the stomach to, to work on the marketing stuff. I know it sounds a bit lazy, but it's more about that. It's, it's more about, uh, I just don't have the stomach to sell myself to people. And, and so I was kind of trying to live this reality of, okay, I'm gonna do something and then I'll wait to see if anybody discovers me. And, and they did, you know? And my life changed radically from that point on. Uh, so that was an unspoken goal. But it, 
it, it was not clear. Uh, it was not an explicit goal. I, I think it's a very weird goal, actually. Oh, I don't. I, I want to be. I want to be discovered. <laughs> you know. Uh, but it's. Uh, but it was. It was fun for me. It was part of the the game. It was part of the the fun of this. Uh, like I said, you know, I don't owe anything to anybody. You know. Um, I had a wife and kids. They would go like, "Yeah, dude, but." you know you haven't paid the bills uh you know for for two months because you're you're in this game that you created but actually no i i can do that and but it was very frustrating at the same time you know i remember thinking to myself but you know i when i was comparing myself to some other people who were had a a massive dose of, of success but their content, it didn't feel to me that like it was that good. And I thought, why are these people, you know, so successful or so famous and, and so uh, popular in the, the social media or the press? But you know what? I can't complain because I didn't put the effort or the work to be on the spotlight as those people did. Regardless of how empty the content is, um, it sounds cruel, but it, it's the reality. You know, you have to, if you want to be known, you have to make a lot of noise and you have to make noise all day long. You know, um, I think that's why I, I don't see myself as, um, as an influencer or a, a social media celebrity or whatever. Uh, I mean, I can, I can, I can become, anybody can, you know, and, and the, the evidence is the people who are, like that you know they came from nothing you know they were nothing and and they became celebrities um so anybody can do it but i i just choose not to i i prefer to just quietly do my my own thing and then if somebody likes it or comments or or follows or shares then that's the plus for me you know but i can't i can't put any judgment on the success of people because they work for that, you know. Uh, there's, a, there's an interesting author uh, in Portugal, a Portuguese author called Pedro Chagas Freitas. Uh, he's a writer. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Yes. Now, he was my colleague in the university, so I know him very well. I know him extremely well, maybe too well. <laughs> and. Um, and so he did the course just like us and he finished the course and then his dream, his goal was to be a, a known writer. That was his goal. And so at the time, this we're talking about maybe 15 years ago, maybe longer actually, but yeah, definitely 15 years ago we had, this was pre Facebook, uh, but blogger, you know, the blogger platform. Yeah. Um, available and people were using it a lot in Portugal, especially to discuss political issues and having political debates, you know, uh, 9-11, the post 9-11, the uh, political state in Portugal and all that. And, and I remember he used that platform to just put excerpts of his writings. I don't, I don't even think he had a book at the time, but he was kind of using the platform to uh, get an audience and just mm. put post uh, short passages. I mean, he's very good with short passages. I've heard people complaining that the books are not that great, but uh, you know, he has some punchlines mm. that can work somehow. And then he was using Hi5, which was a pre Facebook social media channel. Uh, he befriended everybody he could think of on Hi5, even though he didn't know those people. And Facebook took it to the next level. So again, lots of people, lots of quotes, share, 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 share. So he kind of bombarded every channel that he knew uh, with his content. Um, and then he started getting published. And I, I remember some of our, of our colleagues uh, resenting that. They were like, how is he popular? Why, why, why is he a published author? His writing is not that good. Uh, and I'm not here to, to critique his uh, his content but it's more about how actually he's a, a great example of um of success of popularity success not because of the content regardless of his content but more about how relentlessly he worked 
to achieve that goal, to achieve that level of success he was looking for, which is wake up and marketing, 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 marketing. And that's it, you know? Mm -hmm. And it worked. It worked. He's a great example. I, I know a lot of people get pissed off, especially the people who know him very well and know what he was like as a student, uh, how lazy he was, how uh, he would cheat, he would copy everything from other people just to, to get, just to pass the exams. Um, and so they know, they know his nature, you know, but come on, this is a different ball game. You're, you're talking about popularity, you know, being, being uh, known people. And to do that, you have to make shitloads of noise all the time. And also, like, like, it's like you said it also, the guy put it, the, the hard work, you know, the hours after hours, like you were yeah. saying. And, yeah. and discipline. But after success, it's like you said it, man. If you can put your head in your pillow at the end of the night, and you are happy. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And, uh, you know, and I, I've been, you know, some nights I've been restless and thinking, okay, what the hell am I doing here? Why am I, why am I here? What's the purpose of this? It's also important to reassess that and to think, okay. Um, and sometimes kind of move away from that and into something more positive. Uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of, because of the subjects that I'm interested in, and the level of involvement, emotional and personal involvement, I get in into those subjects and the people I deal with, uh, it's also very easy to fall into some dark places, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, well, <laughs> speaking of dark places, um, and I, I'm yet to kind of find a, a way to, to have an alarm bell telling me before it's too late, telling me, watch out, this is now becoming uh, too dark, you know, too, too serious. Uh, I'll tell you kind of a semi-depressing story. Let me just uh, uh, move my non-Instagrammable non ass on the chair. Um, and uh, well, maybe it's Instagrammable, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe You have to try to see it. Yeah, 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 I need to create a page. You know, non is the, the non Instagrammable ass. Um, yeah, it makes story. You know? um, yeah, so I was, uh, it was my second time in the anarchist's house. And so I was in Morocco. My visa had run out. I had no job, no mo very little money saved up at that point. And, uh, and I was trying to, to make it into professional photography, as in regularly paid photography uh, and I was in the Atlas mountains with some nomads you know I was fascinated by their culture by their their faces their, their lives their traditions you know and I was there with them you know I was immersed in that reality and I was as happy as one can get you know I still remember calling my mom uh, the day after I left the Atlas and and I told her look my situation right now is this. I have no money um, or very little money. I'm jobless, homeless, but I, I think I found what I really want to do, which is uh, documentary photography. I, I'm loving this, but I'm, I'm, I'm struggling now. Uh, her response was interesting. She said, yeah, okay, you, you're, gonna be, you're gonna be fine, don't worry, <laughs> you know, which was funny. Um, and around that time, I get a message on Facebook by uh, one of the, the anarchists. Uh, he's an exceptional painter, uh, Sebastian Sheremet, uh, who was living in that house at the time. And I had stayed with them the, the previous summer. And he said, look, uh, we're officially getting kicked out by the town hall, which owns the, the house. Uh, so kind of a, a sign of protest, but also we want to leave in style and what we want to do is to organize a triptych painting so three artists himself uh nate uh, smodish that's the other artist um and igor i can't remember his surname uh, an older uh, painter and so each one of them would be responsible for one section of the painting so you had three uh paintings 
in one called Triptych. And their plan was to spend a month in that house painting every day. Mm, and in the evenings, they would invite a local Slovenian band to perform live while they would be painting. There would be food and drinks. And uh, at the end of the, the painting, at the end of that month, the objective was to then sell the painting in that house at an auction and then revert all the money that they would gain to charity. And, I, and they, they asked me, well, do you know a photographer who might be interested? I was like, yeah, I know somebody who might be interested. And they said, look, you, you won't get paid because we don't have money. We're broke. We're probably more broke than you are. Um, but you'll have a, a room to sleep in in this house. And we'll have, we manage the, a, a local restaurant to sponsor our meals. So you'll have one meal a day. I was like, that sounds good. It's not just one meal a day because this is in the Balkans. So Balkan people would never let you starve or get less than one or two meals a day. You know? So there's always coffee in the morning, some bread, you know, people bring, bring in some sausages and, you know, there's always, there's always food in the Balkans. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I, I like and I connect so well with these people because they, they're truly hospitable. They're not hospitable to impress you or to show up. They, they are genuinely hospitable. Most of those people went through serious hardships, you know, and, and so that was it. So I managed to get my ass to Slovenia for the second time. And then I stayed there for a month. And it was very intense. You know, I would wake up, I would wash myself, get the camera gear, go downstairs, have coffee with them and then start shooting. Uh, kind of documenting what they were doing. And I was responsible for their web page, uh, for their Facebook page. And I would just, you know, on a daily basis, I would report what was going on in that house and with the painting. And uh, I mean, the, the, I, I, th this is another one or two podcasts just for that experience. So I, I, I won't give you many details of what happened in there. But um, I remember the last day, so the day of the auction, Sebastian was just smoking cigarette after cigarette. Nate was just, you know, very nervous. Igor was very drunk, as he always was. Um, so the three painters were in this kind of a state of distress, wondering if anybody would show up because they had a kind of a bad reputation in town anyway. But, you know, the, the whole place got packed. Lots of people came, the local media came, the national media came actually, and and then, you know, there were speeches, there were musical performances, and then, there, you know, the, the lady stepped in. Uh, she's actually a personal friend of mine. She became a personal friend of mine afterwards. Vesna, that's her name. And she, she bought the painting for more than 3,000 euros. And then they reverted the money to charity, you know. And they still managed to stay in, the, in that house for another year, but then... They got kicked out, they got evicted, and they shut down the place. It's still shut down, it's a shame. Uh, that town lost its, um, the source for independent and alternative arts, you know, which was that house. So it's, uh, I think it's a huge cultural loss for that town. Uh, the town is called Novo Mesto, by the way. Um, anyway, and I remember, you know, experiencing that cathartic uh, moment, you know, the, the auction, the painting was sold, and there's the kind of after party. Um, and I didn't even realize how severely depressed I was, how purposeless I was in life, how I, I had failed in achieving uh, sustainability on the road. I was not able to sustain myself on the road. I was not able to make money. Uh, my photography was going nowhere. Um, I didn't want to go back to the nine to five. Once, once I experienced the life on the road, I, I, I felt like it's the last thing I want to do. And I, I, I felt like this very dark um, force kind of pushing me to, to suicide. You know, I, I felt like I'm just gonna end this bucket. You know, I had an amazing time, a couple of years on the road. I'm just gonna end it, everything, you know, and and I was there, you know, and people were drinking around me. And then I get this uh, text message by one of my Slovenian friends. Uh, 
and she texts me and she says, look, um, can you talk? Can we talk now? And I was like, okay, well, this is uh, 2 a.m. or something, or 1 a.m., I can't remember. It was late, so late for her. You know, she doesn't usually stay up that late. And I went upstairs where I was sleeping and I called her and we stayed on the phone and basically she was sobbing and uh, crying and just not making much sense of her speech. So basically she went home that night. Uh, she was waiting for her boyfriend and her boyfriend came home drunk, beat the shit out of her and then went to sleep. And, you know, and for her, this was such a heartbreaking experience that she thought of killing herself. You know, <laughs> that moment, you know, when she was talking to me, I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. And, and I stayed on the phone until the sun rose. So I, I could see the sun, the sun rising. I was like, holy shit, what time is it? So we stayed on, on the phone for several hours and I was just trying to really calm her down and, uh, and for me, it was unacceptable that somebody that precious to me, you know, that, that dear friend of mine would no longer exist. Uh, I, you know, I understood her pain, but I, I couldn't accept that. I couldn't accept the fact that because some asshole beat her up. You now she saw no purpose in her existing hmm. in this uh, sometimes cruel world, you know, overwhelming world. And sometimes we, we kind of think, well, what am I doing here, you know? And, that was hitting her so hard that pushed her to contemplate putting an end to it, you know? And so she never did. She's still alive and well and breathing. And, you know, she's in a new relationship, I, I, I suppose. And, and that was for her, you know, I think it was a kind of a turning point. Uh, she's never been through that experience again. And, and that put myself into a perspective of, okay, what I, the advice I gave her, maybe I should take that too and maybe try something different, you know? And, uh, but I tell you, it was, uh, you know, it, it was a very dark period of time for me. It was, I was very happy with what I was doing, but I was getting no results. And, uh, and I thought and I was too impatient to maybe wait or try something else that I actually contemplated that, you know, putting an end to everything. And, and that's when I thought, no, um, I'll carry on, you know, I'll, I, I need to carry on. Um, so, yeah, that's a bit of a, a dark story for you. No, it's, it's, it's life, life. It's not just the roses. It comes also with the spine. So yeah. it's, it's life, it's life. And now I think it comes also with the next question. How do you describe your mindset, Ron? Uh, in terms of what? In general terms, like, do you describe, how, how do you describe yourself? I, at my point, I will describe yourself as a strong mindset for life. But mm. yeah, I have moments. Uh, I have some moments I think, what the hell am I doing here and, uh, and all that. But um, my mindset is to be as uh, free and independent as possible in, in a sense mm -hmm. of... Uh, I don't want to live what people think I should be living. I mean, uh, some people give me amazing advice. I think I, I, I need to listen. I feel the, the need to listen to every single person, people who are biased, people who are independent, people who are judgmental, uh, mm -hmm. people who say, well, you know, maybe, well, if you, if you haven't tried this, why don't you try it at least for a little bit and see where that takes you, you know? Uh, I need to listen to every single person, but then kind of collect all of that and then make a few decisions, which I think should be reasonable. Now, a lot of the decisions I made didn't work out well. A lot of the ideas that I got from people were not that good, but other ideas were spectacular and they worked really well. So I think... Uh, well, my mindset is, you know, to stay curious, to stay uh, passionate, um, to try to follow an independent thinking and living existence. Um, and that's about it. And 
try to be less judgmental. You know, I, I can be very judgmental sometimes. Um, something shocks me or something I fundamentally disagree with. And I think also part of the reason why I choose less popular or less um, mm, glamorous subjects for my, my, my things is also, it comes also from a place of judgment of, well, okay, well, why, do, why should I stay with some punk anarchist squatters? Yeah, I don't necessarily agree with, uh, in, in theory, with what they stand for. So why should I do this? Um, well, precisely because of that. I don't understand their reality. I've never been there. I've never spoken to any of these people. So uh, maybe I should go. You know, maybe I'll, I'll still, at the end of the day, keep my opinion and my judgment. But chances are I, I will never look at those people in the same way uh, because now I have a, a better understanding, a more uh, uh, a thorough understanding of, of who these people are, you know. Uh, and it was, it was interesting because I ended up in that house and, um, uh, you know, I, I had planned to just stay there for maybe two days, just taking pictures of their art and their creations. And uh, I, I like the, the process of making something. So I, I uh, for example, if there's a musical performance, for me, it's way more interesting to be on the set uh, shooting the rehearsals rather than the performance itself. You know, I much prefer you know, to see the mistakes they make, the thought processing, the brainstorming, all the the journey that they go through to, to get from you know the, the start to you know the final um, uh, the final production you know uh, and that's what I was wanting to do there I wanted to see them painting and creating and all that uh, but then I ended up, ended up staying there for two months you know somehow uh, and um, and I remember they they organized this uh, kind of intimate uh, meeting with other friends and they were all on I think it was cocaine. I'm not sure they, they were sniffing something. Um, and they looked at me and they, they were like, well, do you want some? I was like, no, it's okay. And then I could feel kind of that brief moment of silence in the room where everybody was looking at me like, okay, this guy's not from here. He doesn't smoke, doesn't drink. He's not taking drugs and he's taking pictures of everything we're doing. Maybe he's like a snitch for the police or the authorities. Like you could feel like, and they were, and they were like, mm, okay. but, were, I, I, but I think they were so relaxed because of all the joints they had smoked. So they they, they were kind of like it was a, a, little, a little bit less less sharp to react. And then I remember shortly afterwards, uh, I don't know, a few mi minutes later, it started getting a bit cold. So I I went to to get my jalaba, which is a traditional Moroccan vest. Uh, with a hood. It's a long vest with a hood. Ah. Uh, yeah, which, you know, quite a lot of Moroccan men wear. And, and I remember getting it, putting it on, and then sitting back uh, next to them. And they all looked at me, and I think that was the icebreaker for them. It was the icebreaker and the deal breaker. For them, it was like, okay, this guy's not normal. So, okay, he's, he's, he's one of us. He's one of us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so that was it. The, the Moroccan Jalaba actually was what kind of broke the ice and uh, took our relationship to, to the next level, uh, you know, between a Portuguese traveler and Slovenian anarchist squatters, punk mm -hmm. anarchist squatters. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I would say the mindset itself is, is more about trying to you know i i know i try not to think too much about it i know we're all going to die one day but i i try to i think that's why i try to make the most of what's around and yeah i might regret that instead of spending five years on the beach you know and uh drinking cocktails and just staring at the sea whatever and working a few hours on the computer I chose to be in some uncomfortable places and very different people for me. Um, I, I don't think that regret will come. I, I think in a few years time, I'll be going like, okay, well, I, I did that. That's, that was unusual. You know, that, that's cool. 
Um, yeah, and about uh, the, the photography, um, I'm, I'm passionate about it now, but knowing myself, maybe I'll still be passionate about it in 10, 20 years time, but there is always a possibility that something else will come along and take over, you know? Um, so I don't know, I, I'm open to that uh, perspective. I'm also forgiving about that perspective. You know, uh, when, you, when you have a career or when you do a course, uh, the people around you expect you to become that, if it makes any sense. So Vashka, totally. I, I didn't ask you, what, 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 what is your career? Man, what is your... I'm a little bit like you, man. I, stu I study <laughs> food engineer. After I okay. went to work to France, I spent mm -hmm. two, two years with some punk anarchists also. Nice. Now I'm a cabin crew in Germany. With, okay, uh, okay. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if you experienced this, but uh, what, I, what I went through was, and sometimes it, it happens, sometimes people do, I, I think people want the best for you, but also they want to understand the nature of you. Hmm by putting you inside a box you know inside a little category you know it's more comfortable it's easier for everybody to understand mm -hmm. who, who the hell you are uh and i remember some people almost kind of making me feel i think they kind of resented the fact that i invested so many years in studying and practicing and teaching yoga you know i did two yoga course um, you know teachers courses one in portugal one in england uh, so a lot of it was a lot of my time and, and energy and money uh, were dedicated to, to building that reality and that persona. And so when people all of a sudden saw that I wasn't doing that, they were like, but that's a shame, you know, you put so much effort, you put so much this and that. Yeah, I did. That's true. And by the way, that was my time my money my energy not yours so don't worry too much about it okay it's not like you you invested in me and now i'm a big disappointment You're... no you know i it it's it's my thing okay so don't worry too much don't stress too much about it um but also uh, am i now i don't know sleeping until 8 p.m and and just staring out the window no i'm doing stuff it's different so just see this as kind of a new chapter in my life and don't worry too much about it you know um but but i also don't want to to be dismissive and, and unfair because i would say most people who give advice or they try to push their opinions uh, on you uh i think they they come from a place of caring and a place of you know um you know they, they worry about you and uh, and they probably don't trust you enough or they don't trust the possibilities of life enough to accept that maybe something good will come out of this crazy decision of yours to backpack or to quit your job or whatever. Uh, and I think it's, it's good that we don't push these people away. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we try to reassure them with, okay, but look, but in the meantime, this is happening. So this is good. This is good. And you, you try to, you can't push them away because they come from a, a, a good place at, at the end of the day and they care about you genuinely, you know? So yeah, listen to their sermons, listen to their worries, to their rants and you know, oh, but you should be doing this. Okay. 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 Don't worry. Okay. Uh, because um, I, I think they, they don't come from a bad place. They don't come mm -hmm. from a place of, you know, no, 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 I don't want you to do this. No, they, they want you to be safe and to be happy, you know? And also they, they are giving you the advice with their own reality. Imagine how can your father talk with you about backpacking? If you never, you know, how, like you said, they want the best for you and. Yeah, yeah my, my, mom, my mom doesn't understand this. I think for her, it's very complicated. You know, she always had a stable life, stable family life, uh, a routine. She's a routine person, like 100%. And I do have that in me uh, somehow. I, I, I am a routine person, more than I want to admit. Um, only the, the five years that I, you know, 
prior to this moment is, have been kind of non-routine like. So I, I always try to find little elements of routine here and there. So I, at least I have something I can rely on uh, for my mental stability. I think routine is extremely important for mental stability. I agree. But um, the circumstances are very different now. So I, I, I can't have a, a routine like I used to before. But my father uh, is, even though he also has his routines, uh, he, um, he had a very unusual life, uh, you know, very tragic life in, in a way, uh, because he did burn too many bridges, I think. He, he got, um, you know, he had so many people kind of caring about him. And at the end of the day, he didn't really take good care of those relationships and uh, the jobs he had and all that. Uh, but I do have something from him, which is the the drive to to travel, the drive to experience something unusual. Uh, I mean, this is a man who uh, he escaped the army in the late '60s, early '70s, when it was compulsory for Portuguese men to go to war. Uh, he had a, an eye problem, so an eye condition, so he he wasn't even supposed to be in the army and being a recruit. Uh, and so he, you know, he just didn't agree with the whole thing, you know? So he, he actually did the most risky thing that a Portuguese man could do at the time. So he deserted, you know, he went completely against the authorities. He got chased by the uh, secret police in Portugal. Then he was taken to a, a, a military court and he was in jail for four years, you know? so. Uh, he had a, this unusual life experience at the time when most men would just go to war uh, and deal with the horrors of, of war and, and all that came with it. Um, he actually embraced uncertainty and did, it, did things in his own terms um, and, and pay the price for that, of course. Mm. And I think I, I have a lot of that in me you know if you if you give me something that is stable predictable and nice really really nice but you then wave at me with something hey you know but here's something a little bit different uh, that you've never experienced and it's not predictable but it's also not comfortable it's risky which one do you take I'm like yeah I'll, I'll probably take the latter you know um i think yeah, one, one of the things that I, I, I experienced once was, I think my, my parents had a fight and my father just rushed out. This was when we were spending time in Caparica in a, a beach uh, holiday resort uh, in the summer. And, and he was, you know, he just rushed out of the house, but before getting out, he just dragged me and uh, our dog at the time uh, Diana was her name. So he took both of us out and we just went fast walking, you know, just really, really fast. Uh, and I asked him, where are we going? Oh, we're going to the beach. Okay. So, and at the time I was maybe six or seven years old, you know, and so we walked and walked and walked and walked uh, until we reached the edge of the cliff. Uh, which we called Falesia in, in mm. Portuguese. Now, Falesia was this gargantuan rocky formation that we could all see from the beach. And, you know, you look at it, it's just massive, depending on which spot in Caparica you are. But if you look at the size of it from the beach where we used to go to, I mean, this was immense. This was just huge, you know. And... And we both looked down and like, okay, what, what now? And my dad, well, now we're going to go down. I was like, but that's as steep as it gets. We, we're not supposed to do this, right? And he said, yeah, yeah we're going to do it. <laughs> and I remember uh, I would go ahead, so he would stay behind me. And the dog was in front of me. But at some point, the dog, I mean, who was probably the only rational being 
among the three of us, the dog was just pushing herself <laughs> back like, fuck go. this shit. I'm not going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Not, on my, yeah not on my watch. <laughs> fuck this shit. I'm going to go back home. These, these humans are fucked up. So she was just pushing herself back. I was like, come on, come on, Diana, come on, you can do it. And and then, I mean, we kind of slipped a few times. We almost fell a few times. And then we got to the bottom of, of the cliff. I mean, I don't know how many hundreds of meters or dozens of meters this is, but it's it's in, in, insane, you know? It's and enough to die. It's enough to die, for sure, to die a few times. And... Um, <laughs> So we got to the bottom of it and then we went towards the sea. We crossed the railway, the little railway that goes across Caparica, Caparica Beach. And, you know, and then we just went in the sea and had an amazing, well, an amazing sunset. It was just gorgeous sunset, actually. And I still remember that. And, and the swim as well, you know, after all that adrenaline, it was just nice to get some cool water. Um, and then my father was very peaceful after that. And then we went back home, not, not climbing the cliff, fortunately. So we just walked back. It was a huge, long walk back home around, you know, to get to, to the road yeah. and back, back to the house. Um, and I remember, you know, the, the following week, you know, going to school and just telling all my friends, oh, my God. And I went down the, the, the cliff and they were like, nah, nobody ever believed me, you know, mm-hmm. nobody, which for me was so stressful and so there was no selfies at the time there were no selfies no instagram (laughs) stories no no TikTok, you know but um but yeah so i do have that kind of reckless um, Hmm. side which i i think it comes from my dad for sure you know like um spirit of adventure but sometimes with uncalculated risks um because I, i remember the feeling you know it was great i survived it and it was great we did something completely stupid and irresponsible, but at the same time, very exciting. So it's a cautionary tale, you know, I, I, don't, I don't advise anybody to, to try anything like this, but, um, but that's in me as well. Yeah. That's also part of my nature. You know, if there's something potentially dangerous or potentially risky, I think a little bit about it, then I go for it. You know? I think it's, uh, it's a beautiful description of your mindset and <laughs> not always not only yours but your father and your mother it's also there i want to know like which kind of routines because i like also routines and i think it's important to balance our life which kind of routines yep. do you have in Beirut? just to have an idea man like the... yeah uh well and in I... traveling in general yeah yeah Mm, Beirut is interesting because uh, now it's so hot that mm. during the day it's very difficult to actually be active outside, which is what my field is. You know, I go out and I shoot. Um, I would say that you know to check the phone to see if there are any assignments for the newspaper for sure. Um, go out and shoot, uh, but I always have this uh, this thing which is. At the end of the day, I always come home and I smoke some shisha. Okay. So I'm a smoker now, believe it or not. Um, after 42 years of existence on this planet, uh, shisha is much, much worse than normal cigarettes, apparently. But I think because I, didn't, I never smoked for 42 years, I, I have a bit of leeway, I guess. Um, and, uh, you know, talking to my friends, uh, I don't know. Um, Editing pictures, although I much prefer to take pictures than to edit, to be honest. Uh, I think the, ju- the juice is the action rather than sitting down and, and looking at photos. Uh, you know, posting stuff on social media to, uh, to kind of tell people, hey, this is what's happening now. Um, I do miss reading. Uh, I have to say, uh, and I've noticed this, the internet is so distracting for me that... Uh, if I have internet connection on a regular basis, I just tend to spend time on the internet. Um, whereas, you know, when there's no internet, uh, you know, first there's that moment of, oh my fucking God, you know, why is this happening? 
Uh, and then very quickly, uh, then I become more drawn to going back to basics, which is to read. Uh, so I, I don't have any physical books on me, but I do have, um, uh, have Kindle uh, downloaded on my phone. And so uh, the other day there was absolutely no internet at all, not even data uh, for a while. So I just found myself just opening Kindle and just uh, flicking through some, some pages of some random novel. Um, so I do miss reading. I, I think it's, um, it, it was such a, 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 an omnipresence in my life. Uh, especially when I was in Portugal, I surrounded myself with all these books and, you know, uh, I would, I would read a novel, but I would just read a novel. I would read a novel. Then I had the encyclopedia to, this is pre-internet, of course. Um, or at least home internet. There was an internet outside the house, but not, not at home. And so, you know, I would read a novel, but then I had an encyclopedia with the, the, the author's life, you know, the, the biography. Uh, then I have the dictionary as well. And so all of these things. So I had at least three books working simultaneously when I was reading a novel. So I missed that. <laughs> Whoa. And I, lo I love also to read. Which, which book in this conversation do you will advise me to read and to the listeners and viewers? Um, hmm. Okay, it depends. I think there's, there's a, a really interesting book by uh, Robert Glover called No More Mr. Nice Guy, which, uh, you know, if, you, if you're familiar with rock from the 70s, that's also the, the title of a song by Alice Cooper. Uh, it, that book for me was, was transformative in a sense that, not, not that I, I, I stopped being a nice guy, but uh, he talks about the nice guy syndrome, about how for many different reasons, um, men are nowadays raised as nice guys you know mm. uh, our mothers don't want their kids to to be like cavemen like the their husbands or ex-husbands um so moving away from kind of that uh, toxic masculinity reality mm. of you know man is a man and you know we mm -hmm. treat women like garbage and whatever um but in the process uh men somehow lost touch young men ha have lost touch with their own masculinity and what, what hmm. it's about to be a man um uh, and he includes a lot of exercises uh, because he, he's a therapist so he includes exercises on how to uh get in touch with your masculine side uh because that's also important that that's our nature as men okay. you know? um so that 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 is a very interesting book, a very interesting read. Uh, the art, okay. the art of not giving a fuck by Mark Manson, awesome. for sure. He's a very I mean, he's a very good writer. Uh, I think he he's he, he has that ability to uh, study and to research a number of subjects, you know, psychology, sociology, um, entertainment, and all and all that, and then kind of break break those down. To make them digestible for people. Also, he, he has a very good humor, good sense of humor. Um, hmm. I don't know. I think the classics, uh, The Great Gatsby, for example. I think that that's that's such a good book. Um, so well written and so insightful about the, the nature of of, of people. Uh, you know, uh, well, I, I could talk for hours about that that book. Um, yeah, these, uh, these books, uh, on thin ice by mm. Werner Herzog. Uh, so he, um, a German director and basically, uh, he wrote this book when he, when he found out that uh, a dear friend of his was dying of cancer, I think. I'm, I'm not sure, but she, she had a terminal disease. And so he just decided to walk and we're talking about, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of kilometers on foot. Uh, and he just basically walked and wrote uh, a diary about that journey, that walking journey uh, that he made to meet his friend. He didn't even know if he would get to the destination before she was gone, you know? Uh, fortunately, he did. He, he managed to get there before she died. Um, 
And, and that's one of the, the advices he gives, you know, you want to be a filmmaker, you want to be a, an artist, a creator, uh, then quit film school, don't go to film school. And instead, you know, walk from, uh, I think it's Madrid to Kiev, you know, and take the camera with you and just record everything. And, uh, and, and he, he said, you know, if he would ever have a, a film academy, he would, which kind of defeats his own advice of, you know, quit film academy if you want to be a filmmaker. Um, but he, he would kind of uh, include that final exercise, uh, kind of a dissertation-like exercise to his students, which was, okay, I want you to just walk from mm -hmm. one place to another in long distance maybe take two or three months to do it and write a diary on it and I will I will read that diary afterwards and I will know if you did it or not because I, I know I've done that experience so I know what kind of a transformation uh, you will experience when you read something who, who went through that um, you know that journey um, so yeah, Herzog is, is interesting. Actually, I just remember the film, not a book, a film called uh, The Straight Story by David Lynch. Uh, which is kind of, yeah, which is kind of like the, the less Lynch-like film, you know. Okay. Most of his films are kind of eerie and uh, uh, surreal. Um, but this story is about how this, uh, this old man who can't even drive a car anymore because he's so old and he has a condition, uh, he finds out that his estranged brother is actually about to die. He has a condition and he, he's going to die. So uh, Alvin Strait, that's the name of the character. Alvin Strait is told these terrible news and he's feeling this this pressure of holy shit it's kind of a reality check for him which is oh my god i haven't I haven't seen my brother in years i haven't spoken to him and if he dies that's it there's no redemption there's no way to you know to reach okay. you know? so he decides to go but he can't drive so he gets his uh, small uh, tractor which is kind of a a lawnmower, you know, um, and so he decides to travel thousands of kilometers on his own from one spot to another, uh, and hoping that by the time he gets there, his brother is still alive, but he doesn't know that. Nobody knows that, and and so you follow his journey, and then through his journey, you, you know, he he meets all these different characters, different people, and he learns from those people, even though he's he's an old man. He also teaches and passes knowledge other people he goes through a lot of risks as well a lot of discomfort uh it's a very very beautiful very straightforward film but it kind of reminds me of what uh, Werner herzog was suggesting you know just just go uh, experience that you know and yeah so that's it i mean i i can talk to you a lot about movies and books and, and all that i'm seeing many you are like i already took some notes and after i will put in the description the movie included the straight yeah, if story. i remember yeah if i remember something else i'll i'll send you a message later please please i want now to talk like the biggest if we can say or the biggest one that you remember the biggest lesson that you learn while tra traveling mm. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, I have two moments. I, I, I think, I mean, I, they might not be the most important, but the, the, at least for now, the, this is what I remember. Let me just get the camera. Yeah. So uh, the, ins the uninstagrammable ass was complaining once again. Mm. Um, okay, there are two things. Uh, one was when I was in Morocco, my first journey to Morocco. It's, Morocco is a very different reality, socially speaking, religiously speaking, from the one I, I was used to. And I was not in kind of the touristic Morocco. I was in the off the beaten track Morocco. Even though Morocco as a whole is a very touristic country and you have lots of touristic places scattered across the entire country, it's also a country that is easy to offer you a, a non-touristic experience just around the corner, you know? Uh, so I was m mainly doing these um, 
Atlas Mountains remote villages or Sahara Desert villages and just staying with the locals. And I remember one night I was uh, without uh, any power on my phone. I didn't have a torch. And it was one of those moonless nights. So you don't even have the lights of the moon to, to help you. Uh, so I couldn't find my way. I, could, I knew I was on the road, but I didn't know where I could camp. And then this Land Rover uh, passes by and I start waving, just ask where I could, where I could camp. And, and if it was safe, because they have wild dogs in, um, in Morocco as well, you know, stray dogs, but they're kind of wild, you know, they live in the wild. Uh, so they're not necessarily the, the most welcoming creatures uh, when you're walking alone at <laughs> night, you know, or camping. I had I, I I had many encounters with some of these creatures, and uh, and I'm a dog person. I love dogs, but I I, I didn't like those experiences. Um, and so they, they they were covered with these hoods inside the the the, the Land Rover, and they kind of uh, they called me come 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 and then they dragged my bag and I was like okay. I trust this. I'm not sure. And they weren't speaking French. I can speak Tamazigh, uh, which was their language, which is a vernacular language in uh, North Africa. Um, and then, you know, I was with them. I couldn't understand anything they were saying. And then all of a sudden, the, the Land Rover just drives straight into the desert. And I'm like, okay, this is very strange. And I, and I had heard about kidnappings in that area of Morocco, um, especially by the Polisario. Uh, these are some, uh, you know, some serious rebels and people who are trying to claim Western Sahara as an independent country from Morocco. Uh, and I thought, okay, maybe I'm, I'm now, I'm now going to join the national news as uh, yet another casualty of of, uh, of kidnapping, but. Uh, we approached this uh, this house, this um, uh, low, very long house in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the desert. I'm like, okay, what the hell is this? So they dragged me out of the, the Land Rover. They rushed me into the house. They were clearly in a rush. I didn't know what it was. And I end up in this room, and I take my shoes off. I end up in this very wide room with maybe 20 or 30 men just on their knees looking down, I'm like, okay, what the hell is this? And then there was a man praying. And from the mood, I quickly gathered that this was a funeral. And it was. Uh, so these men were late for a funeral. It was the third day of, of uh, you know, um, giving the condolences to the family. And, and so in between the prayers, people would just flock around me. They were like, oh my God. Where are you from? You know, some people spoke in French, so I, I was able to communicate with them. My God, where are you from? You know, what are you doing here? Uh, can we have your Facebook? Immediately, you know, welcome to Morocco. People always want your contact and then they, they, they want to stay in touch. And, and then, uh, and then the more prayers would come, tea, cookies, prayers, tea, cookies, you know, kind of a, a routine. And this went on for like two hours. And then the main meal came, you know, couscous with the uh, lamb, I think, or chicken, I can't remember. Served in huge portions so everybody was able to eat. And once that was over, they left. I thought, okay, this is my cue. I need to leave because, you know, uh, I just crashed a funeral. You know, this is, uh, I don't think this is normal. And so I grabbed my affairs and then I, I, I was about to leave. And then this young man, comes to me and says, oh, no, 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 we prepared the place for you to sleep. You're staying the night with us. Please stay here. I'm like, yeah, but I just crashed the funeral. You know, there's just this man who died. You know, this is a tragedy. I shouldn't be here. I said, yeah, that man was my father, you know. And I was like, your father. And you're worried about the well-being of a stranger like me. And he said, yeah, that's our culture. We, we, we must do this for you. So they prepared me a place to stay. I slept there. I woke up the next day, had breakfast with them. He apologized for the noises his father was making because he was sobbing and crying because of the loss of his son. And I said, come on, this is your home. And, you know, he, you're crying. You know, your, your, your grandfather was crying. You know, come on, that's, that's the only normal reaction I can think of. So come on, I, I'm not judging at all. I'm still feeling quite bad for being here because I, I feel like I shouldn't. And he said, no, don't worry, don't worry. So he introduced me to the whole village uh, once we finished breakfast. He was showing me, you know, we're talking desert. There's nothing there, nothing. But they found the source of water 
uh, underground. And so they were extracting water from there to irrigate a few plants that they had, uh, that they were hoping to farm and grow in that arid land. And uh, it was incredible to see you know, so much resilience. Uh, when you just look around, you think it's impossible. Nobody can survive in this environment. Um, and then an older man came and he started speaking in Tamazir with uh, Aziz. Aziz was the young man. And so they walked, I walked with them, but not understanding anything they were saying. But from the tone of the conversation, I gathered it was something very serious. Then the man left and Aziz apologized. I'm sorry, you know, we didn't speak in French, but my uncle doesn't speak French, but this was very important. And I was like, well, what happened? He said, well, uh, he said, now that your father is gone, um, I will become the responsible, the sole responsible for for what happens to this family. So uh, I will make anything possible so that you will stay in the university and that there is always food on the table for you and your family, you know? And that was so humbling, it was really powerful. Uh, in the West, most people wouldn't do this. Most people would just say, well, just get on with your life, you know? It's not my problem. Uh, but they were so connected you know they were so strongly connected and they and they they are responsible for each other you know mm -hmm. family especially for muslim uh, people uh, family is everything religion you know god of course you know that that's the foundation for them but uh, the family and the importance of the family and the importance of taking care of each other is paramount it's there, there's no argument there's no discussion around it it's just that you know and for me it was like wow it's, i just experienced a, a very a very powerful very important moment in these people's lives you know these strangers i've just met them a few hours ago the day before um and the other the other moment i would say i mean there are many moments and i i really uh, i don't want to neglect anything i think all all the important moments were you know very important for me but there was that moment when i was leaving the anarchist's house the first year i stayed with him and i was at the time still figuring out what what am i supposed to do what's my purpose in life do i want to be a traveler a photographer a writer um, what, what, what what am i doing and i remember i, I said goodbye to sebastian you know, i gave him a big hug and and then he says hey man we, we talked a lot we talked a lot to each other um, about about life, you know. Actually, the day before something interesting happened. Uh, so we had he was working on a tuner's car. He was spray painting a tuner's car, uh, creating his art, and the car won multiple awards because of that painting. It was so different, so um, unique, you know, off the roof. Yeah, it was so amazing. Yeah, and um, and I spent all those days just filming because they also wanted the, uh, a, um, a film, you know, a video mm -hmm. record about how how the painting had been made, and you know, and he worked his ass off for that. Now we we talked a lot, and I, I remember telling him, man, you know, these these guys, these stoners in Morocco, they took so much money from me because you know uh, they met me, they. They say, hey, you know, we need some money. Can you help us with some money? I was thought, yeah, sure. But then it turns out they, were, they just needed the money for the weed, you know, the smoke weed. You know, I was very, very stupid to, to fall into that. But in Morocco, it's easy to, to, to fall into that if you don't watch out. Um, and I remember telling him this, and uh, among other things. And then the night, the last night I stayed there, uh, I was waiting for him because he went back to the, the tuner's car just to paint something. It was supposed to be for half an hour, but he stayed there for five or six hours. It was an obscenity like this. He came home, he was really tired. And then he said, so you're gonna leave us tomorrow? I was like, yeah, I need to move on, you know, carry on my journey. Like, okay, you know what? Then he grabbed a hundred euros and he was just like, poof, put it on the table, this is for you. This is for you to continue your travels, man. I was like, whoa, 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 no, 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 please. You know, you're broke. You guys are super broke. Come on, 
come on, take it, take it. You know, uh, I don't want to be the stoner who takes. I want to be the stoner who gives. Come on. You know, so he's kind of like trying to redeem all of these people who were taking money uh, to buy weed. And he was like, come on, just take the fucking money. I was like, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Please just keep the money. Um, and so the next day, you know, we were saying goodbye to each other. And I was still kind of lost about my purpose in life. And he turned to me and he said, hey, man, maybe you're already doing what you're supposed to do. I was like, yeah, but what am I doing? He was like, this. I was like, yeah, but what is this? Am I traveling? Am I, what, what, what am I doing? He was like, it doesn't matter. You're doing it. You're already doing. So deal with it, you know, accept it, embrace it. Don't worry too much. You know? That was that was nice to hear. <laughs> you know, even though it was like I still don't know what am I doing, but okay, I'll just keep doing it. And but it's I'm I'm re- like it comes to my mind something that you said it before. Sometimes we want to put everything in the in a box, you yeah, know. I think so. And sometimes it's like man. Sometimes you are a writer. Sometimes you are a traveler, and you are a photograph. You are the three at the same time, you yeah. know. And now coming. One of the last questions, talking about legacy. What is the legacy that you want to leave behind you? Uh, none. I don't want to leave any legacy. Uh, uh, maybe that's my feeling now. Maybe in a few years' time, I'll go, oh, my God, I wish I had left a legacy. Um, I, I don't have that in my list of purposes, if it makes any sense. Um, I, I want to be happy. I want to make people around me as happy as possible. I want to follow the motto of try to wake up every day and tell yourself, don't be an asshole, you know, mm-hmm. uh, because it's very, very easy to become one, you know, even if you're not one, but you may do some unpleasant stuff to other people. It happens, you know, we're human. Um, but I try to live life in my own terms and do the things that I really, really like. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, um, legacy, you know, whatever you want to call it, is going to be a collection of the things that I did, Mm -hmm. that we all did, you know, our legacies are are, are that, I think. Um, And they will include you know, in my case, hopefully some interesting photos that people can either recall or they can revisit or they can just see for the first time and go, wow, okay, well, what was that? When was that? Who was that? You know, what was happening back then? Um, I would like to write more. So, you know, I, I have something, you know, some written insights about what, what was happening at the time. But, you know, legacy, yeah, I, I, don't have a, I don't have a specific purpose of leaving anything behind. Um, it, it's, things will be left, I think. Mm-hmm. Some things will be preserved, you know, thanks to the internet. Uh, but, no, I haven't thought about that yet. <laughs> maybe, maybe one day I'll think about legacy. But I think, like, already the photos for me, and it's a great legacy, man. At my point of view, and it is just opinion. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, man. And new projects that you have, new ideas like the book that you want to read, that you want to share with us. Yeah. Um, I want to to work more on personal, specific personal journalistic pieces, uh, like photo essays. Uh, about specific communities here in Lebanon. Uh, I'm, I'm drawn to, to the sea, so I really like to hang out with fishermen mm-hmm. and, and get their stories, you know, um, portray that. Uh, I would like to go back to Georgia at some point and finish my work on the refugees and the Soviet, um, uh, the, the Soviet sanatoriums. Uh, I would also like to, there's this story, um, and I, it was a shame I, I never followed it up when I was there, 
So there's this Moroccan lady who lives alone. She, so she's divorced. She escaped her husband, which, you know, in a society which is so conservative, um, with, it, nothing wrong with being in a conservative society, but if it's toxic, then it's, it's not that good, of course. Um, the family is everything, you know, the wedding, you know, the marriage is everything. So if you kind of step out of that, especially as a woman, there's an immense pressure put on you but uh, her wedding was so her marriage was so unsustainable it was so brutal but the guy was very abusive that she left and she left with her only kid and uh, because she's a she's a sahara person so she's she's a person of the desert uh now she lives by herself in a little hut in the middle of the sahara desert and so she relies on herself, on her resilience, and I would love to meet this this woman. Uh, I have I have a contact. And they they told me, look, we can put you in touch with her. We don't know if she's going to be willing to be, you know, to be followed, so to speak, mm. by a photographer or a documentary maker. But we can we can definitely put you in touch. There's this, um, which I think it's, I think it's a really important story. You know, uh, it's it's not just a, a person who went through a breakup and now she's a single mom. She's a single mom in the fucking Sahara Desert by herself. You know, um, the other the other story is this shaman, this uh, Croatian shaman. He lives in the forests outside Zagreb, which is the capital, and uh, he was restoring a boat, a wooden boat, and he wanted to sail. Uh, <laughs> across the Adriatic and then the Mediterranean to go to North Africa and heal people with his uh, shaman uh, knowledge. So he seems to be so outlandish, so completely off the wall that uh, you know he, that story caught my attention. So who knows if these people are still around? And you know, I would like to to work on that. But once again. This is totally unpaid, unfunded. Nobody's interested in these stories, uh, you know, in theory. And so I, I'm fully aware that I will have to take time off mm. and, and then just spend my money and my resources on spending time with these people. But time is the essential thing for me. Um, this is another thing I wanted to add, which is, um, which is affecting, severely affecting the press and the overall storytelling nowadays. You know, in the old days, a National Geographic photographer would spend three months on location. You know, his backpack was just filled with uh, film rolls. And so they would have uh, the luxury to spend an extended amount of time with the subjects. Um, but that luxury gave the opportunity for them to truly understand you know uh, the the people they were portraying, um, and so time is key. You know the the best they say that the best storyteller is time. So you you allow the story to breathe. You allow the the storyteller to really understand the nature of their subject. So for me, uh, between you know spending a day with a subject because you know the the publication is waiting for the story to get published or not getting paid and actually spending my own money but going to a location and spend two months there with that subject i prefer this last option mm. um hopefully you know uh, somebody is going to be interested enough in the in the story and they will pay if they want to have it published chances are maybe not but once again, I don't let that get in the way of me doing that. I, I, I'm not in a position of life at the moment, fortunately, where, um, where I have to say no to unpaid stuff. You know, um, if I want to do something, I will do that thing. Um, and for that, I need time. And time is time is key for me. Mm, yeah. It's beautiful. And now, where the people can find you in the social media? If they want yep. to, to follow up with your work? Sure. Uh, well, I have my personal, uh, well, professional uh, photography page. Uh, 
so I'll, I'll let you know about the link, but I'm more active on Instagram, uh, even though I'm not overwhelmed with joy with the, with the page, but there's Instagram and uh, there's also Facebook. So yeah, th those two platforms are the ones that I mostly use for my, my photography. I will put also the, the site in the description of the, of the interview. Cool. João, any last thoughts, advice that you want to share with me and with the listeners, viewers? Yeah, don't come to Lebanon. No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Come to Lebanon. Come to Lebanon when, when uh, well, COVID kind of calms down a little bit, I guess. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm very humble in that sense. I, I, I can't, I don't feel myself in a position of authority to suggest anything. Um, but I would say if you if you're curious about something or if you if you feel drawn to something in particular uh especially if it's something that is unusual something that you've never done before or people around you are likely to criticize um don't stifle that uh desire just because or that curiosity just because you have all these voices around you saying, well, that's just silly or just dumb, you know? Um, if it's not harmful or potentially harmful, uh, and if, uh, even if there's a certain dose of calculated risk, if it's something that is, you know, it's beeping inside you, you're like, mm -hmm. yeah, but, yeah, but I, I, maybe I would like to do that. Then nurture that, uh, make those beeps, louder louder to the point that you cannot ignore it anymore and now you have to do something about it um because that could take you into some really really interesting uh journeys and experiences and worst case scenario you can always go back to your old life and go like well actually it wasn't that interesting but don't ignore it you know nurture that i think it's a great advice for a person that no, no, how to give advice. I think it's a great, great advice, man. Like, mm, and thanks. great, man. And just let you, just to let you know, man, to go about the dark. I think you are in the dark, but you <laughs> are a warrior of the light, man. You are. I uh, think that you really, 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 really. I think thank you, man. Is, well, that that's that's just because of my phone, you know. Also helps. Also. <laughs> <laughs> That's my life at the moment. Good, good, good. <laughs> Thank you so much, man. Don't forget to Thank follow you. João in the Instagram, Facebook, and check it out the, the site. If you want to work with him, please let him know. Guys, don't forget also to put the like and subscribe the channel. A great day for everyone. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much. Peace.